stretch out your arms into wings, to soar, to follow the gull, the tern, the swallow, the eagle, to glide, at one with, at home with, the breeze, and then in one timeless surge, to shudder to life. To throw off your shackles and fly. Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, December 17th, 1903. Four times they flew that day. Four times the ready signals were exchanged. The motor caught, the propellers turned, the restraining wire fell free, and the improbable assembly of wood and glue and cloth and wire and faith in wild surmise incredibly achieved liftoff and rose to meet the spanking December breeze. First, Orville. Time, 12 seconds. Distance, 120 feet. Then Wilbur. 12 seconds, 175 feet. Orville again. 15 seconds. A flight of 200 feet. Wilbur at the controls once more. Up and away for 59 seconds. 852 feet. Then, in the moment of victory, a trick of fate. Shortly after the fourth flight on the 17th, a gust of wind caught the flyer and turned it over, damaging it beyond immediate repair. Of course, that first plane was a marginal plane. I mean, it had just enough power to pull up, but they had everything figured to the minute detail. Horace Wright, and, uh, nephew of Wilbur and Orville Wright. When they realized they could control it and it had those qualities, then they thought, well, now we'll build another one. And they never flew that uh, 1903 plane again. And Ivanette Wright Miller, no niece of the Wright brothers. Huh? No electricity. They reminisce no about the early days, Oklahoma. about the brothers' cycle shop on West 3rd Street in Dayton, and the first powered flight. I was in the second grade, and uh, nothing unusual happened that day until toward evening when Aunt Catherine came with a telegram saying that the boys had flown. They said the flight was a success and they'd be home for Christmas. Uh, my father was to uh, inform the press so he took the telegram and went on the, on the streetcar down to the uh, press and asked for the Associated Press representative. They said that if it was, the flight had been 59 minutes instead of 59 seconds, they would have printed it. It was less than a minute. It wasn't newsworthy. Still and all, they were glad to hear that the rights would be home for Christmas. With the coming of the new year, now that was 1904, the brothers returned to the cycle shop on West 3rd Street to continue researching and developing their project. From the diary of Orville Wright. Monday, January 11th, 1904. Spend morning in town looking up work on patterns and getting castings for cylinders and pistons for three engines took old engine apart to get new measurements for making new engine. In Wilbur's letter of January the 18th to Octave Chanute, his friend, his advisor, his fellow enthusiast, we are at work building three machines with which we shall probably give exhibitions at several different places during the coming season. Ribs and uprights they fashioned out of spruce. The new 18 horsepower engine would carry a heavier machine, 800 pounds or better. By gearing the engine to run a little faster, we will not only carry the additional weight, but will have enough surplus to increase the speed to about 40 miles an hour. Five years of calculation and preparation. Five years of trial and error, culminating with Kitty Hawk. And now, five winter months they set aside. Orville invented a tunnel. Most of their calculations came from that wind tunnel. And of course, the first thing would be your, uh, how much power the wind had in actual pounds per square foot, inch or square foot. 
And then I think they uh, tried different surfaces and um, they worked out a ratio between the lift a surface had and the how much it pushed backwards against the wind. The wind would push backwards. And uh, most of the early calculations were based on those two factors. Five months to perfect their machine, to make ready to climb higher, farther, and faster, outdo their own creation. When Uncle Orv and Uncle Will came home from Kitty Hawk, they felt that they had to find some place closer to Dayton to do their flying. And they needed the space they could afford. They uh, found one place that uh, seemed to be uh, quite all right for f flying, uh, east of Dayton, east a little bit north, uh, northeast of Dayton. And they went to the farmer, uh, Torrance Huffman, who owned the land. It was called Huffman Prairie. It was sort of a boggy territory. Wilbur uh, went to Torrance Huffman and asked him if uh, uh, they could fly there. He offered them this land rent free. The only thing was if you just didn't bother the cows. Huffman Prairie was a boggy flatland on the bank of the Mad River, much as it is today. A haven for native North American grasses, the big blue stem and Indian grasses, and prairie wildflowers. For bobolinks and upland sandpipers, for woodchuck, foxes, 13 line ground squirrels. It's hard to believe that this perfectly preserved reminder of our past is now a part of the space age Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. A traction trolley, the Dayton, Springfield, and Urbana Electric Interurban Railroad, known to one and all as the DSU, or damn slow and uncertain, stopped at Sims Station, a small depot adjoining the prairie. With the lumber, tools and materials they carried to the site. The brothers erected a simple hangar to house their new flyer, building the world's first airport in the process. This pylon marks the position of the first hangar. The 1905 flyer was assembled here on Huffman Prairie. With Orville at the controls, they made a successful takeoff from Huffman Prairie on the 26th of May, 1904, at 2 in the afternoon. The first flight was a short one, and far from smooth. It grounded with a resounding thump, spraying Orville with mud as it bounced forward and skidded over the hummocks, cracking a number of the six-foot white pine spar. A close call. Orville could have been seriously injured, but the brothers were jubilant. They were flying again, successful again, making history again at Huffman Prairie. Huffman Prairie was a far from perfect testing ground, 50 foot trees, fences, poles, and power lines. As Wilbur wrote to Octave Chanute, in addition to cattle, there have been a dozen or more horses in the pasture, and as it is surrounded by barbed wire fencing, we have been at much trouble to get them away safely before making trials. Also, the ground is an old swamp and is filled with grassy hummocks some six inches high, so that it resembles a prairie dog town. This makes the track laying slow work. While we are getting ready, the favorable opportunities slip away, and we are usually up against a rainstorm, a dead calm, or a wind blowing at right angles to the track. By the end of July 1904, they finished modifying the new machine. They moved the gas tank and radiator back and increased the width of the propeller blades. They used a catapulting device, which Wilbur called a derrick, to help propel the craft on takeoff. First time up, Wilbur flew nearly 2,000 feet. On the 15th of September, Uncle Will made a half circle. My father was out to the field, and on his way home, they collected on the black platform of the attraction and among them was a reporter for the news, 
Well, he was talking to Dad there, and uh, he said, well, what did they do today? Well, Dad said they went up and flew down the field, and they made a turn and came back. And uh, he said, well, if they ever do anything important, let me know. Well, that was the first turn that was ever made on a, an airplane. September 20th, Orville made the first complete circle in the history of the airplane. Amos Root, publisher of the magazine Gleanings in Bee Culture, drove nearly 200 miles from Medina, Ohio, to witness this flight. It was the first published eyewitness account of one of their flights. The 9th of November, Wilbur completed almost four circles of the prairie, two and three quarter miles in five minutes and four seconds the best and longest flight that year. In January 1905, the Wrights offered their invention to the United States government, but the War Department was unwilling to contribute funds toward its development since the government felt that their machine had not yet been brought to the stage of practical operation. During the previous year, the Wrights had made 105 flights. On May 23rd, they began working on their 1905 model and completed it in June. It's on display here in Wright Hall in Dayton's Carillon Park. They call it the Flyer 3. It was their first fully practical airplane. The operation of the tail rudder and the warping of the wings were made independent of each other. The camber of the wings was changed and twin elevators called blinkers were added to assist the rear rudder in making a turn. They flew 10 miles, 11 miles, 12, 15. With the Flyer 3, they learned to circle and bank and turn. Finally, on the 5th of October, Wilbur made the longest flight of the year, 24 and 1 5 miles in 39 minutes, 23 and 4 5 seconds, at an average speed of 38 miles per hour. They decided to discontinue flying until they received the patent on their invention. The patent wasn't finally issued until May 22, 1906. It was apparent they wouldn't be able to sell their airplane in this country. Well, if the United States wasn't interested, there were a lot of European governments that were. Turned out, the unknown boys from Dayton were big news across the water. They traveled with their sister Catherine to England and to the continent. They were received by cheering crowds of aviation enthusiasts, as well as heads of state, including Edward VII of England, Alfonso XIII of Spain, Kaiser Wilhelm II, Victor Emmanuel of Italy, and George Clemenceau, Premier of France. Wilbur was all but idolized in France. He broke the world's endurance record with a French journalist aboard. All this publicity didn't go unnoticed at the White House. The man who believed in the big stick wanted to be sure it had wings. In June 1909, the Wrights returned from their victorious European tour. If people didn't know who they were before they left, they knew them now. The hometown boys were welcomed back to Dayton and the United States with a huge homecoming celebration, a burst of wild acclaim and a glittering reception. Later that summer, in August 1909, the Wrights sold the Army its first airplane for $30,000. Final acceptance trials were held at Fort Myer, Virginia. Orville had the controls. Lieutenant Frank Lahm, the celebrated balloon pilot, was the observer. Specifications were exact. It had to carry two people, sitting upright, and be capable of remaining aloft for one hour. And it had to pass a speed test of 40 miles per hour on a cross-country course. In addition, Signal Corps airplane number one had to be capable of wagon transport. We stood at the crossroads of two eras, one foot on the gas, the reins in our hands, and our eyes on the wild blue yonder. In 1910, Uncle Orv 
and Uncle Will returned to the prairie and they were ready to go into business. They'd constructed a factory on Dayton's west side to manufacture their airplanes. By November 1910, they were turning out two machines a month. The Wright airplanes were coming of age. They were very sophisticated in comparison to their earliest aircraft, the Wright Flyers. Now Wright B. Flyer Incorporated of Dayton has built and flies this machine, which is very similar to the Wright's military Model B. Contact! The Wrights continued to develop the Huffman Prairie site. They built a new and larger hangar adjacent to the Sim station stop on the electric trolley line. They planned to use Huffman Prairie as an exhibition headquarters for their flying company. But first, they had to train the pilots to fly their planes. And so, they opened the Wright Company School of Aviation. Instruction by the Wrights and their staff cost $250, payable in advance. Students were not responsible for breakage to the airplane. They came from everywhere, Army and Navy officers sent here to train, civilian men and women learning to fly the airplane they bought. They trained for 10 days, spending 5 to 15 minutes of each day in the air. They learned how to maintain, repair, and modify their machines as well. One of the students was future General of the Air Force, then Lieutenant, Henry H. Arnold. He was often entertained in the Wright's home. Hap Arnold maintained his friendship with Orville Wright for many years. In 1929, he was stationed back in Dayton as commander of the Fairfield Air Depot which encompassed the site of Huffman Prairie. Orville was a frequent Sunday dinner guest at the Arnold residence, located at what is now Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. In those days, Huffman Prairie was a beehive of activity. Visitors came and went continually. Large gatherings came together for special events. Everybody wanted to fly, and many people received their first ride in an airplane over Huffman Prairie. We went across the road to where the airfield is. In August of 1911, down, Orville Wright took his 15-year-old niece, Ivanette, up for her first airplane ride. Her sister, her cousin, and she were the first children to fly in America. Uh, going over the uh, plane to see that everything was all right for our, our trip. When we heard the clip of the propellers and the noise of the engine, we three went out to where the men were working. Captain Chandler had, it, had her all buttoned up in his coat and gloves. I climbed over the wires and into the seat next to Uncle Laura, and we were off. We were sitting on the lower wing of the plane with our feet braced against a strut. I looked out over the wings that were carrying us up and the ground that was falling away. Here we were in mid-air with the wind blowing in our faces. You just can imagine it. We glided down to a perfect landing in time to catch the trolley. That was my first flight in 1911. I was 15 years old and I haven't been the same since. As the replica of the Wright Model B flies over the original Huffman Prairie site at Wright-Patterson, it reminds us of the days when Orville and Wilbur Wright taught the world to fly. When Wright aircraft were the main attraction at county fairs, state fairs, air shows, races, exhibitions, any place an airplane could draw a crowd. The Wright Company had licensed airplanes sold overseas by British, French, and German companies. The school and exhibition company flourished.
fame, fortune, a well-earned place in history, what more could the future hold? From the diary of Wilbur Wright's father, May 30, 1912. This morning at 3.15, Wilbur passed away of typhoid in Dayton, aged 45 years, one month and 14 days. A short life full of consequences. An unfailing intellect, imperturbable temper, great self-reliance, and his great modesty, seeing the right clearly and pursuing it steadily, he lived and died. His death was a terrible blow to Orville, to Catherine, to the entire family, but especially to Orville. The team was broken. In the wake of Wilbur's death, Orville assumed the presidency of the Wright Company and kept the flying school and exhibition company running. He also continued his experimentation in aviation and his personal career as an inventor. In 1913, he was awarded the prestigious Aero Club Trophy for his development of the automatic stabilizer shown here on the Model E, one of two Wright models that featured a single propeller. Under Orville's guidance, the Wright company continued to manufacture new aircraft, experimented with hydroplanes, developed a wheel control and an automatic pilot. In 1915 and 1916 on Huffman Prairie, a continuous flow of Wright students graduated to become the world's earliest pilots. Canadian students, eager to earn their wings for World War I service, enrolled in the famous Wright School of Aviation. One of them, A. Roy Brown, was credited with shooting down Baron von Richthofen. In the summer of 1916, the Wright Aviation School trained its last pilots and the prairie fell silent. It was the end of an era. In 1917, Huffman Prairie became part of Wilbur Wright Field a U.S. Army training school for pilots in World War I, and the forerunner of today's modern Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. The abandoned hangar remained standing on the prairie until World War II. In 1940, monies donated by the citizens of Dayton were used to honor the Wrights and those they taught to fly on Huffman Prairie. This memorial to the Wrights and their achievements was built on a bluff overlooking the prairie. Among those attending the dedication ceremonies, Orville Wright's former students, Major General Henry H. Arnold and Captain Kenneth Whiting. In 1978, ownership of the memorial was transferred to the Air Force. Today, if you look along this arrow, you'll see Huffman Prairie is pretty much the same as it was in the early days. The same line of trees borders the prairie on the north. Grassy hummocks and wildflowers still dominate the landscape. Only a simple pylon to remind us that this spot was once alive with the buzz of biplanes in the hands of daring young aviators. Hoffman Prairie, little has changed. Only the sounds, only the shape of things to come. But the spirit of the place the spirit, it's the same. The same as it was the day the Wrights stopped by to try their wings. <laughs>